Story Mode. Story Mode. Welcome to this week's episode of Story Mode, where we talk to gaming founders and executives from the gaming industry. I'm your host, Olya Kalujne. Today, I'm excited to welcome David Gardner, co-founder and general partner at London Venture Partners. Welcome, David. Thank you. David is an industry veteran with 30 years of experience in gaming. He spent over 25 years at Electronic Arts, where he held various roles, eventually being a senior leader in their worldwide studio organization as studio CEO. In 2008, he joined Atari as their CEO, completing a childhood dream of running the most famous name in computer games. There, he transitioned their business into digital and MMO development, including acquisition of Cryptic Studios. In 2010, he founded London Venture Partners and has since invested in amazing companies like Unity, Natural Motion, Singularity 6, and Supercell, and us. So again, welcome, David. Excited to have you on the show. So first of all, to start, do you have any exciting news or announcements that you would like to share? Well, I think the industry is in an exciting time in general. So I get, we'll get into that into some detail. But, uh, you know, we are constantly investing in new founders and teams and startups. So we have just concluded one that I can't quite fully announce. It's in the synthetic character AI driven space. That's uh, a really cool team. We'll come back to that in, in weeks to come. We've invested very recently in, in Look North with, with Alex Seropian, who helped co-found Bungie and Industrial Toys. He's working on some great stuff on UEFN. Uh, some of you may have played some of the releases. It's into the fast release category of very exciting content. That's something that I think people are understanding how long it takes to build something and how fast you can get to revenue. And then a business level, LVP has had a first close on its next fund. We're already, it's hard to believe this is fund number four. So it is a, you know, it's a long journey to build a, a platform for investing, but also a long journey to bring capital together. So we're excited to have this continuity of capital. Even though we haven't fully invested from three, we wanted to make sure there was no gap in the market. So yeah, we're in great shape for the future. Awesome. We'll come back to LVP and, and investments in a few minutes. But to start off, you've been in gaming your entire career. Did you always want to work in gaming? To deliver newspapers before I was in gaming. So I, it's my second career. Majority, let's put it this way, majority of your career was in gaming. Did you always know that you want to work in gaming and how did you get your start at EA? It's a great question, but you know, when you look back, it's just, that's what I've done. Actually, there was no gaming market when I, for, I literally as a paper boy, it was before personal computers. And then the Apple II came out and the TRS-80 and some of these early machines. I used to go to the supermarket and look, I couldn't afford to buy all the magazines, but I could look at like popular mechanics. And, and I remember the, the one I did buy had the Commodore PET on the on the cover and like, what is this incredible looking thing and personal computers had just arrived and once i had my eyes on that i was just obsessed and so i guess in some way and i was young i was you know a teenager and that was the start of a love affair that continues today so i'm so excited to have been born at just the right time to join the industry at just the right time to have spent my whole life in the game space so how did you move from delivering newspapers to working at ea i used all my newspapers route savings and, and a little bit of money. I had like, I think a thousand dollar savings bond certificate that my mom and dad gave me. And I uh, bought an Apple II. And without getting too into the weeds, so Trip Hawkins, who founded EA, was also at that time uh, still at Apple. So I became a fan of Apple, had an early, like a uh, serial number 2000 machine for an Apple II. And through fate, destiny, and um, good luck, I met uh, somebody who had made software for the Apple II that knew trip. And at CES, I met this uh, Trip Hawkins guy who was fascinating because he was working on this new technology project, which turned out to be the Lisa, the predecessor to the Macintosh. And uh, Trip and I uh, had a big argument about a company. And at the end of that meeting, Trip said, I'm going to hire you one day. And six months later, he did. And so I met him uh, again at the uh, at a Condex in Las Vegas where I, I lived. And he followed through on his promise and made me come up and interview. EA uh, had got its first round of venture capital funding, had eight employees. I had to interview with each employee for two hours each. So I had 16 hours, two days of interviews and got the job. And then I found out some years later, apparently everybody said, what are you doing? You're hiring a kid. I was 16 at the time. And uh, said, you can't hire a kid, we're a startup. And uh, apparently Trip persuaded them and I got hired. So yeah, it was great because it was part of a 25 year journey for me. Wait, so you started working at EA when you were 16? Well, I interviewed at 16. I was 17 when I started. So I was uh, 17 years old. 
old. And uh, yeah, a great experience as a kid. I always thought I would eventually have something to do for a few years and then I would go you know, to university. But I never managed uh, to get out of the machine. I had no idea. I just knew you were early at EA, but I had no idea that was that early. This is amazing. I 11 and I was uh, yeah, 17. So what was your job? What were you hired for? Then I was, I mean, everything was made up, right? I was marketing analyst. So I was actually, ironically, of all the startup people, I was the only one that actually worked, I would say, I kind of worked in games and then I worked at a computer store in Las Vegas selling, you know, it was my part-time job and I sold Apple IIs and I sold, you know, whatever games that were out. And at that point, uh, all the games were kind of shipped in Ziploc bags and then might be on cassette, might be on a, on, a, on a floppy disk. And so I actually played all the industry original games. I knew the industry, I knew the pricing, I knew the margin structure. I bought all the games for the stores. So I knew at that at that time, everything was like kind of a 40% margin. So I knew the, the distributors, I knew. And so I brought all the kind of that perspective to the team. And then I did sales training. I, said, I trained all the reps because again, I played the games. Uh, I eventually set up customer service because I was the young one and the low one on the totem pole. And they're like, make David do it. You know, I was called DG because- That's the origin of DG. Okay. Yeah, there were three other David. So I had to become DG. And then eventually I did international support. And that's when I fell in love again. I fell in love with the international markets. They, yeah, I never, I never stopped. So eventually I ended up running and building EA International. So that was really cool. That's an amazing story, David. I did, I did not know about this. I genuinely did not know. I'm glad that we're doing this episode. So finally, like a few years into knowing you, I know this story. So actually, because this experience is so interesting, I'll jump ahead on, on another question because you, you, you founded London Venture Partners and you're a general partner there and you've been doing that for a few years now. But as somebody who was an operator for multiple years and you started that early on in the gaming industry and at EA that obviously became massively successful, how do you apply all that experience to your investing approach approach at LVP? Well, we are unique at LVP because all of the partners are game industry executives. So we've all had long careers and senior careers and have been through the kind of the growth curve, which is, is I think, really essential. And the ability to kind of filter I, I, in investing, I think, you know, trying to do multiple things. There's the math of the investing and maximizing kind of, you know, what, what an investor gets, how much the company owns, all that kind of stuff. But that's a bit more technical after you decide, is this a team and a product and a genre? Of, of business that has high potential. And the reason we focused LVP on the game space is because we have all these decades of experience, all this operating experience that allows us to accelerate decision-making in the right category. Is this in the top quartile opportunity or not? We can get to that place very, very quickly. Then the other aspect of that is once we have concluded a deal with a founder, we can help them on strategy, on hiring, on senior connections across the industry. And what I've discovered is that also helps me feel like I'm adding value and that it's the dopamine hit for me as, an, as, a, as a VC. If I help a founder and they appreciate it and it makes it, it moves the needle. Wow, we all are great. We all feel good and it's exciting. And so I wanna do it again. And so that's something that's very helpful. I, if I didn't know the subject matter, I would just be a generalist. I, I don't know, I, 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 we tried looking at other things outside the industry. I even tried after I left the company, I had a sabbatical, I tried consulting, I consulted with Vodafone. I just, I didn't like it. I, I didn't, I didn't, wasn't feeling like I made the, the kind of important connection that you make with people and knew the topic. Just... Was there any one specific thing that was the catalyst to start the firm? Yeah, two things, actually. I was, as an angel investor, investing across founders and things that I've believed in. And that was going really well. And the second thing is then myself and a couple of other founders tried to start a new company and we tried to raise money and VC didn't understand gaming at all. And so we thought, well, this is a hole in the market. This is bad for gaming. We need to help create a new source of capital so that founders didn't have to just rely on publishers or friends and family and kind of credit card capital. And, you know, we were early in that. And I, and, and now we, there's, you know, I don't know, dozens, but maybe a dozen different kind of funding choices for the games industry. And that I think has brought a lot of interesting competition and innovation to the space. So uh, yeah, those were the kind of triggers. That was over a decade ago. So now it's it's much more mature. What happened with the company that you were planning to start? It's never got started. It's probably now a tired, overrun idea, but it was in that kind of transformation and in, in the digital market space. I ended up getting distracted and running Atari, which as, as you nicely commented on in the intro, was a heart thing. It was the, that kind of first love brand. I eventually sold my Apple II and bought an Atari 800 and kind of cheated on Apple for a few years. And um, yeah, now I'm back to being a, a, an Apple fanboy and Atari's kind of a shadow of what it used to be. So I love the the, the body language discomfort, as you said, that you should eat an apple. <laughs> 
So let's step back actually. For those who are not familiar, could you give an audience an overview of LVP and your investment philosophy, including a like typical stage you invest in? We know it's, it's the gaming space, but what's the deal size, any geographical focus, any other areas that are important? To you? Yeah, we are focused on games. Well, I call it the games ecosystem. It's like we're, I think, also unique in that we've been involved in the biggest content company exits, people like Supercell. We were early, very early first capital in investors and the biggest kind of tools, technology, uh, the wider tech space, Unity, for example. David Lauke, one of my uh, co-founders, uh, was chairman of Unity before it raised in America. So we have a lot of expertise and depth, and we're not afraid of, of content, and we have a lot of expertise on the on ecosystem. So Samo is a great example as well, because you're what we would call an ecosystem player. Uh, you're helping enable this industry to grow bigger, be more successful, more profitable. And we love both sides of, of the coin. Now, we're early stage. We think that we have superior insight into to teams and what they're building because of our long history in the game space. And that's where we want to deploy it. And then we want to help those teams get ready for the later raises that are usually necessary. And uh, of course, it's a risk reward. So we're writing smaller checks for seed and series A, uh, but we own, uh, you know, a similar amount of the company as the later stage players. It's just they're coming in later. So we're writing one to $3 million checks. We'll, as I said early, and then we'll follow on if if the stage size is, is, is still within the fund kind of uh, competence and capability. Do you typically lead or do you prefer to follow? You know, I, 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 I we, we just need grownups in the room is what I jokingly say. If there's no other grown up investor, we're happy to lead. We typically have led, but uh, it's not a, we, not something we'll die on the sword over. We do focus on Western markets. So Europe, which is a broad geography because we've done investments uh, all the way down into Israel. And, uh, and sometimes we've done things like uh, we've got one investment in Chile, Santiago, and then North America, but we don't invest in Asia. Not that it's not an interesting market of entrepreneurs, but I think you really need local expertise and, and, and that's uh, for other investors. Last question about your approach. Would you say that you're, you're thesis driven as a team or opportunistic? Well, we are both in that we have uh, numerous theses around what we're looking at and we go through a quarterly process of updating that and, and having lots, lots of interesting internal debates. But ultimately you react to things that come to you. We probably in the beginning used to think, oh, you have a great idea. We will kind of will it to be, we'll find founders and shape things. And you know, you're know, you not running the company as an investor. You need a, an entrepreneur and a group that is willing to, to put in that incredible sweat equity to, to uh, the, you know, the kind of lack of sleep, the lack of eating or the lack of social time to get things stood up. So that is just so powerful. And you meet that along the way. And w the sweet spot, of course, is when you meet uh, founders and teams that are really, well, not, not just agreeing, but are in the areas that we have high confidence in for what we'll be developing as, as large return companies. So they're you know, either going to be in a, in, you know, it's easy now to look back and say, okay, early investing in mobile game companies, the Supercell era, uh, we, there were so many unicorns that came out of that space. We were in a few of them with natural motion and supercell but uh, and unity kind of powered uh, that uh, so that was a perfect storm but of course we we saw the whole king explosion that ipo eventually went to activision we saw we've seen so many industries seen so much, much value created through mobile it's incredible but that's an example what is the version of that today we can talk about that later on yeah let's definitely talk about that and we'll come back to the uh, the, the thesis and what are the areas that you're excited about now as well a tactical question so vc vc and gaming ecosystem very network driven industry so obviously to 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 meet you guys to be able to to get to know you that's the best route usually is the network and an introduction if somebody doesn't have a common connection with you how do they get in front of you well i'll tell you a story about the most innovative way <laughs> somebody did that i was sitting at my office there's a there's a seating outside up front and one of those boston robotics style dog robots came in and it was carrying a box with my name on it and uh, kind of a 3d holographic picture and uh, in it was a whole pitch for a business and the, the kind of team that delivered it were the entrepreneurs and so they made a splash entrance of course i took a meeting with them just because it was so funny and impressive sadly they weren't ready for investment from us but they got a meeting <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, if you're determined, you'll figure it out because, you know, what you're trying to judge is can people overcome the odds? The odds are unfortunately very against 
new companies. It's a bit like games. A thousand games were released a day, and if even one of those thousands is, is kind of economically successful, those are pretty good odds. So founders have to figure out how to cross that, that difficult got the valley of death. That's a good story. It's always good to have stories, actual stories of how people got over the hump. So thanks for sharing that. All right, let's switch gears. Let's go to what's happening now. VC investments in gaming and overall have been going down. We're all painfully familiar with that. And we all, to a certain degree, are familiar with the reasons for that. But at the same time, most of VC activities, especially in gaming too, has been in the early stage. So pre-seed, seed, a little bit of series A and then later stage are very, very tough place to be. Can you give a little bit of background and your take on what's driving these trends and how it's impacting your approach as well as a firm? The simple explanation is poor returns. That, I think what, what happened was too much money came in too quickly and probably, you know, kind of all over all the stages. But right now, you're right, it's very tough at the at the kind of series B, even A, A B, C. All the later stages is tough. It's not tough at seed because we're happy to deploy if the team has a great idea and has a great team. But the risk and the challenge all teams have to overcome is how do they get the cash in the door to continue? So it's either by building a product they can charge for, so customers will pay, or it's the best of the best. It's in that top, top, top category where later stage financiers will say, you know, you don't yet have revenue or KPIs either, you know, kind of depends on your kind of product, whether it's retention data, whatever you're driving, or if it's a tool or technology, but we can see the potential and their fear as an investor is overcome by the greed or the excitement over the opportunity. Now, uh, the product problem we've had, I believe, is that uh, way too much money came in, which is pretty closely tied to the COVID moments where the game industry soared because people were locked up at home. What are you going to do? And it is a very cash generative business. It's a very exciting business. We benefited from COVID, even though we had some adjustments. I mean, the industry is bigger now than COVID years, but all this capital that kind of rushed in a little bit chaotically last minute and a lot of investors that didn't really understand what the key value drivers were. I mean, people were raising big checks on, yeah, I used to work at, you know, name your mobile company or any of the kind of PC, giant PC companies, Blizzard, uh, you know, Riot Games, uh, some ex-Supercell founders, all those, uh, you know, that money just got sucked up and huge numbers uh, that it, I'm not sure venture has business of taking $100 million AAA risks before there's any proof that that's a high value concept. Venture has, there's very, private uh, capital is very deep. I mean, we've seen people like SpaceX or Uber raise tens of billions before, you know, they've they've generated in revenue, but uh, not revenue, sorry, profits, but they've been able to prove the business model. They proved traction, user excitement, something. So if you, if you raise a hundred million and you go away for four or five years to build a game and then come back and say, right, here it is. And then, oh, by the way, guess what? Most new IPs don't work. Even, even successful, historically successful teams have a hard time going, you know, into the box and coming back out with a win. It's just not going to work. People are not going to be able to suffer these big hundred million losses. And we're going to see tons of write-offs and uh, rebalancing of asset values on that, uh, that, investors have made and all this stuff has to be cleared out. But what do I know? The games industry is bigger than ever before. It's highly profitable and consumers love it. And uh, it's it's a great industry. So it will sort itself out. It's just, unfortunately, all this stuff has to blow through the drains and get flushed down the system. Let, let's, let's talk about A and B. And I understand they're sufficiently different. But for A round these days, what would you expect to see from the product and traction side to be able to raise A round? Well, I think we'd have team complete. You would have a fully playable subset of what you're trying to build. So much so that consumers are playing it. And then you would have some, and you would have had enough money to go to some, some scale of you know, 10,000 plus players that are on a consistent basis that you can give real data. And uh, yeah. What about B round? What do you need to show there? Well, most B rounds that I've seen, people are using that for actual scaling. So they have the economies up and running. They have cohort retention data. They have the ability to show what the lifetime, well, they, they have forecasts, I guess, on LTV that's positive against their marketing spend. And then they're using that to, uh, uh, to bring in customers. That's a bit more of a mobile description on PC. Probably don't need to be around. You probably are making money and then you maybe you're deciding, okay, I'm going to go multi-platform. So a B round will help me spin up teams to port to more version. But to be honest, I'd be surprised you wouldn't be, if you wouldn't be able to self-fund that. 
On the PC side. On the PC side, yeah. Let's talk about the pre-seed and seed. What are you looking for in those companies these days? We're looking for something that will, uh, well, we're usually we're looking for a special team. After having met literally thousands of teams, you just get a sense very quickly that they're thinking differently or quickly and they really are motivated to break through. These teams that are kind of incremental, maybe we're not interested. Maybe it's an okay business idea, but it just, with so much noise and so much that you really have to be breaking through somehow. It has to be a pretty exciting and you can see something. Um, a good example recently, I mentioned this this team working on this synthetic character so that it's fundamentally an AI model generating personality of the character, but not just a chatbot, which we've seen. And, you know, that's okay. I, I just don't know how much value. I mean, we're going to, you know, people are going to want that. And, but I don't know that that's like creating real value. One of the key things we have to se separate as an investor is, is this a really nice business? That's more of a, what we call a lifestyle business. It might be profitable. It, you know, it might do 10 or 20 million in revenue and make, you know, 5 million a year, which is awesome. And they should do, it. but we only have six to 10 slots a year. And most of those aren't going to work, but we need the ones that do to be worth 500 million over five years. And they're probably going to be doing 100 million in revenue in five years. And that's roughly the growth trajectory. You know, that's what we're after. So we have to then figure out if that has that potential for scale. And, uh, the, you know, the team that's building the, the kind of synthetic characters is, I do see a world where you're going to have a, a bit like you go to an agent and you say, you know, I need the best kind of dramatic actor or or, uh, somebody that uh, you know has an amazing voice or is very scary or whatever your kind of criteria are and you're gonna be going through thousands of castings and you're gonna you're, but you're gonna you're gonna buy the whole package and you may reskin them you may decorate them how you want but the kind of behavioral training, et cetera, is going to be so expensive and so perfected. This is what specialty companies are going to do. And they're building a platform that's uh, super cool to enable it. And they have a whole commerce piece around that. And I, I think that's has potential of scaling very, very large. And the team have the right uh, academic qualifications. In this case, I think uh, deep science is needed to be successful. But crucially, they've worked in the games industry. So they already had a number of breakthroughs in the Way they're architecting this, they're making sure the runtime is very efficient. They're not trying to have a long server tail that's going to be computationally demanding. Uh, so you can already see they are perfecting the offering for the games world, and that comes from their games background. So they are repeat founders. All those things tick high on our list. And then finally, are they good learners and listeners? You know, you've probably met plenty of people that think they know the answer to everything. That's fine. I don't mind if that's your starting position. But as soon as you start getting data that is contrary to your your position, you need to humble yourself, take it on board, figure it out and say, that was wrong. I've improved it. This is better. That's so hard to find. People don't want to hear, you know, now we get data. We've got to use it to, to, to be our friend. So that was actually my next question about the people. And you talked about a few things already throughout this conversation, but let, let's consolidate that in, in one question. You, you've been running LVP for more than 10 years, with 14 years now. You did angel investing, you were an operator, you worked with founders closely before, before LVP as well. And so you've seen those cycles in gaming, in economy generally, and in gaming specifically. What are the habits and practices that you have seen successful founders adopt to first stay afloat and then ultimately get successful, especially in those you know, tougher economic times. And, you know, I can, I can, I can tell you from personal experience, it's um, being a founder. It's also really, it's really hard to see other fellow founders not succeeding. How have you seen people deal with that, but then, and then, and more than just deal, but get successful? Resilience is probably the leading factor and then rapid learning and ability to face their fears. I've personally experienced being stuck like a rabbit in the headlights, you know, in a tough business situation. You know, really not wanting it to be the way it is. The data kind of keeps getting louder and louder. You're kind of more and more stuck. You don't want to disappoint investors, fellow employees, uh, you know, the, the whole kind of uh, customers, et cetera, all the kind of stakeholders. You just got to make those tough calls and you got to move fast. That's probably the one advantage that a startup has. You know, it's, it's a rapid strike force. It's not a super tanker. Super tankers have different advantages and you've got to really play to those strengths. So yeah, learning, 
and adapting and making progress and, you know, having a really good fast cadence and making those course corrections along the way. We've all seen it. People stick to the thing that's not working for too long. They burn through their cash. They end up with not enough runway left. They can't raise more money and uh, it's just, they get into the death spiral. You know, it's it's okay to, to change. I mean, Supercell is easy to talk about because it's been so hugely successful, but they pitched something completely different on Facebook and to their credit, they thought, well, this is not going to be very interesting. This is not working. They killed it and set themselves free. All that talent they had in the company, they had to make some changes or shrink the company, but they had a lot of talent in the company that could then be redeployed to figuring out what was next. And then they spun up uh, various mobile games and then history of the making. So yeah, setting people free to, to do what's working and then being super focused. I probably learned that from Ilka and the Supercell team, which is I kept coming with more and more ideas and they said, great idea. We don't have any bandwidth to do it. We're staying focused on this. So having a very tight focus list so that you can achieve and make progress and do it quickly. All right, let's talk about the future. So AI and, and let's come back to the thesis areas and opportunities that you have seen coming your way and what's, you know, what's coming up next. So AI is obviously making a lot of waves. I think there's also been a lot of noise. Sounds like you found a great company that's that's solid and has a lot of substance to what they do. What are the areas that you're diving in deeper, you personally, you as a firm, and what do you see coming up on the horizon? I am a very much an optimist on the future. I think more people are going to play more games on more devices in more countries, more places in the world than ever before. We are roughly halfway there. So we have a long way to go. And uh, obviously it's, it's not always up and to the right, but we, you know, we're not in a, um, you know, we're not in a declining industry. I was trying to think of a good analogy, but, uh, you know, it's the, you know, thank goodness we're not in a declining business. And I, of course, am a huge believer in AI, but it is, you know, what's interesting about AI is my understanding of its, of its source. I mean, there've been lots of kind of computer science professors, et cetera, that have been thinking about AI for a very long time, but the actual implementation of it started from the games industry. I mean, one of the very leading developers of AI has been DeepMind, which uh, is, was started by Demis Hassabis, who was the AI programmer. Theme Park, which was Bullfrog, published by Electronic Arts. I was the product manager there. I used to sit next to Dimas as he was late at night finishing that, and I was working on marketing copy. And, you know, it it, this push of gaming around AI has helped shape the thinking and the tools and the technology. NVIDIA was primarily building graphic chips for the game console companies. So it's quite interesting to see how gaming has led this this leap forward, which has enormous potential for all of humanity. And even now, I think we can safely experiment with AI in the game world without having catastrophic effects you know, in the real world. So I think gaming uh, and AI are best of friends. And I think this is really great uh, for, for what, we're, what we're doing. We're investing in the, the development and expansion of the games world. And just at a, at a sort of simple way, we look at AI in three different categories. There's the AI that will make game making uh, you know, faster, better, cheaper. Uh, there's AI that will make the gamers experience much more thrilling, more believable, more exciting, more exotic, wow. And then there's the AI that helps the business of game publishing, kind of the, the economies around marketing, sales, uh, customer satisfaction, et cetera, et cetera. So, and we're interested in all three of those categories. We being a, a, a smaller early stage fund, we're not doing foundational models. We're not doing the kind of the deep, dark research that say uh, uh, an open AI uh, would be doing. And as we all know, those those teams have raised billions and need to raise billions to handle all the compute and all the, the very long-term uh, cost base there. So, so the application layer on top of that is what we're really interested in. And I think that, you know, if you just play that forward, that that's enough, uh, that keeps us busy right there. I mean, we, we are still interested of, of course, both in content and the EatWire ecosystem and looking for teams that are, are really unique and able to make a big difference. I think just, you know, simple things we're going to see, uh, we've invested in, and again, I, I mentioned Alex Ropian and, and his team at Look Far North. I think, you know, they are using uh, new ways of reaching consumers at hyper fast speeds, learning about what genres and products are going to be great. They clearly know how to build a AAA product, but what nobody knows is 
what people would love to buy. So, you know, that that's a really interesting breakthrough and it breaks the that kind of problem of time to revenue. So that's an important reality check in today's world. Yeah. And then user generated content is a huge theme. You know, we're seeing it's a way to obviously build community, but it's also a way to build a workforce, kind of keeps people engaged and satisfied. And uh, mobile is probably the toughest space, uh, not to be on, a, on a, too much of a downer, but it is a wall to climb because with the big shifts that have been driven initially by Apple's um, you know, impact on IDFA, you just have to have economy of scale that startups don't have. So you have to, to get really lucky. Luck, luck isn't something we want to bet on. You know, that's like monkeys throwing darts at a dartboard. That's uh, that's too risky. Wait, which which platforms do you see potential in? I think we have fewer and fewer hardware platform shifts because it's continuous upgrade. So mobile phones are basically the market upgrades every you know, kind of two or three years. In the, in the old days, we developed the platform theory where the consoles shifts, plat, you know, PlayStation 1, 2, 3, 4, and those are kind of five to seven year shifts. And that was that. Was that. I think that you know PCs constantly upgraded every every year. Phones the same. Console most likely moving increasingly into the cloud, so that will be also constantly upgradable. So platforms is probably not the the uh, the big shift. It's more like business models or consumer groups or IP sharing across different uh, formats. Uh, those are going to be the kind of breakthroughs that drive that drive growth. All right. Again, reflecting on your on, on your experience in, in the gaming industry again, and you have seen ups and downs. Do you see any parallels or similarities in, in terms of what we're going through now with what you might have seen before as an industry? Yeah, I so here's what I find a little weird. The data says we're up, but everyone feels down. So that is something that is a little bit different. Now, I think we slightly got out of phase because I mentioned earlier that the COVID effect was very good for consumer demand and pulled a lot of spending forward into games, which then everyone, I don't know if you remember, everyone was getting hired and there was competition between all the other engineering disciplines, et cetera. So now we're having layoffs whilst revenues are, are arguably at their highest point ever. Some people are arguing around inflation adjusted, da 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 da, but that to me is also uh, that, that that actually to be honest. It doesn't seem to explain the magnitude of the layoffs, but yes. Okay. No, no, and also free to play. I mean, you know, inflation when something is is free to, to deliver, free, you know, free, it's a free business model. It's hard to apply inflation. I think we don't maybe have the metrics, but player time is a more interesting metric. Uh, there are some challenges around, I mean, ultimately that's going to be the final arbiter of our industry is if we don't capture people's time, they're going to go somewhere else. So, but it's true. We've had ups and downs in the games industry, but these are kind of, as you zoom out, those are noise levels you don't see. So when you're really up close, as we all are in this, you know, in the industry, we feel it. It's very hard to zoom out. I bet you, if you ask customers, how is the games industry going to go? It's great. Have you seen the latest? Have you seen what they're doing with Fortnite with, uh, you know, the OG? Have you seen that? Have you seen, wow, this new release on, you know, oh my God, this new mobile thing, you know, I think they're as happy as could be. So, we just have to get our act together and build things affordably and uh, yeah, that deliver results and accept when the product's not good enough or the timing was bad and we move on to the next project and then, yep, yeah, then we're going to be fine. I do want a very healthy investor friendly industry. We don't want to be blacklisted a bit like, you know, investors hate films because they think, oh, you know, it's a black art, da, da, da. We want the games industry to provide good ROI. So we want the venture industry to be good at it. Uh, you know, we want, if you look at all the capital that goes in and all the profits that come out, you want that to exceed. You want a positive ROI, just like when you do user acquisition, right? <laughs> so that's... Looking into the future, what are you most excited about for the gaming industry? Uh, I mean, uh, it's such a boring cliche. I'm excited about AI. I think it's, it, even personally, it's captured my attention. I'm playing with it uh, as just as a interactive tool, I'm starting to see just little things like one of our investments has an a, a wolf. I think it was a wolf. Anyways, a kind of a cool a pet, and you brief it. You say, "Go grab wood from the tree," and you you speak it. Goes through the LLM. It gets converted into player actions. The wolf goes and does its thing. It just it's so fascinating stuff like that. I get big bubbly and excited again. So. And this is obviously just scratching the very beginning. I, yeah, I think it's, uh, I think it's all going to be super mind blowing. And if we don't all blow up and die in a horrible ball of fire. Don't kill everybody. Just keep playing with this fun, new, cool stuff that's coming out. So yeah, the next few years, amazing. Awesome. David, thank you so much for joining us today. It was an absolute pleasure. Thanks for taking the time. Always fun to chat with you and, and uh, fun to virtually interact with all the, uh, all your audience. 
So looking forward to our next. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for listening to us. We'll be back with next episode next week. Bye for now. Thanks, Thanks. 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 for listening. You made it to the end. Congratulations.